Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. It is a huge question on the minds of parents. Their child's safety as they head back to school amid the current surge in COVID cases. San Antonio ISD is encouraging vast vaccines and masking, but cannot require them. SAISD will be welcoming back students and staff for the new school year next week. So we're taking a look at their COVID-19 protocols. Tiffany Huertas reports on everything from mask wearing to what happens when students feel sick. While it's back to in-person learning for all students at San Antonio ISD, there will be some exceptions. If a, a doctor said that a child had some immunocompromised, you know, conditions and that it was too risky for the child to be around large numbers of other students who are not vaccinated and who are not masked, then we would get the medical. If a student presents a medical note, they could be approved for virtual learning. And there would be a review and a discussion so that we would be able to determine if that child qualified for virtual or homebound instruction. Associate Superintendent Tony Thompson says they are asking parents to let the district know if they want their child to wear masks or not. Teachers and administrators and other campus staff can certainly remind children you know, to put their masks on, wear them consistently and correctly. Thompson says if a student is showing COVID related symptoms, parents will need to pick up the student. Because we're going to encourage parents to get them tested quickly and we will provide resources to them so that they can easily access free testing sites with quick results. Thompson says they will continue doing contact tracing. The district also says if a student tests positive for COVID, they will be asked to stay home as well as those that may have been in close contact until their quarantine period ends and symptoms have improved. We will also continue the practice of sending out notifications to parents and to staff associated with the campus when there are lab confirmed cases. Just you know, to be transparent. South San Antonio ISD is also starting classes next week and has similar COVID protocols. The district says cleaning crews are disinfecting areas daily. SAISD is hosting eight vaccine clinics at high school campuses this week, including here at Edison High School. They're offering COVID-19 vaccinations for students 12 and up. To learn more about all of these COVID protocols in our area school districts, visit KSAT.com. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. All right, thank you, Tiffany. Some of those protocols being updated. We're continuing to update that web article. COVID hospitalizations, meantime, continuing to shoot up today. The latest count, 855. That's an increase of 160 people from the last official report on Thursday. Our Garrett Berger tells us that's placing hospitals under a lot of stress. Health officials say vaccinations, like the ones you can get here at the drive through clinic at the Alamo Dome, are the best way to avoid going to the hospital. Right now, COVID patients are flooding in. The head of the Southwest Texas Regional Advisory Council, which oversees the area's emergency health system, says things are getting tight at area hospitals. He's basing that on how many ER diversion requests there have been lately. That's when an emergency room is getting swamped and asking EMS to divert patients to other hospitals for a few hours. But if too many hospitals request ER diversions, Strack and the San Antonio Fire Department override it. And diversion override means everybody's on divert and everybody's going to have to be open because the ambulances have to have somewhere to go. So diversion override is uh, been used frequently over the past, say, 10 days. We've had, you know, eight or 10 of them just over the weekend. It's not just COVID, though. Contributing to the pressure on hospitals right now are staffing issues and more people going to the hospital overall. Patients will still get taken care of, Epley said, though if you've got a non-emergency condition, it's going to take longer than normal to get treated. Epley says at least 90% of the hospitalized COVID patients are unvaccinated. The city's continuing to push for vaccinations, though it is it is cutting its hours here at the Alamo Dome Clinic, where it says there's been a low turnout. They want to focus instead on the community events. You can find a list of those on the city's website. I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside with live cam this evening. Saw some good rain in some places to start off the week, Adam. Yeah, what a start to Monday and even an end to Sunday. We had a uh, heavy downpours out there, heavy rain, some localized flash flooding officially at the airport. 
just over a third of an inch, but it also, of course, kept our temperature down 87 the high. You look at some of the rainfall totals elsewhere. You got get up into northern Val Verde County, two and a half inches. Del Rio about 0.41 wide ranging accumulations overall. But there were some spots of our area that picked up over three to four inches of rain and a few localized seven inches. That includes a uh, spring branch. You look at the radar right now. There's some activity off to the north and northwest of San Antonio. A lot of this has fallen apart and is just light rain moving into the Bernie area, moving down I-10 from Kerrville to Comfort on into Bernie. A little downpour, an isolated one popped up moving toward the Hennis and Hondo and Hondo. I don't expect that to be all that long lived. Most of this action is falling apart as it heads southward, but still as we see there in Medina County, we can't rule out a few little showers popping up here and there the rest of this evening, but it looks like the main event is over with for now. A few spotty showers at 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, mostly cloudy. And I think overnight tonight, the higher rain chance is farther south of San Antonio. We'll talk more about that, go over some more rainfall accumulations, and when we clear out of this pattern, coming up, Myra. All right, thanks, Adam. It is week four in the trial of Otis McCain, who was convicted one week ago of killing an SAPD detective. The punishment phase continued today with the prosecution attacking McCain's character and talking to the mother of his child. Our Erica Hernandez has been following the trial since its start and breaks down some of the testimony the jury heard today. A drug dealer and a bad father is how the prosecution described Otis McCain in testimony today. Larry Hill took the stand, the grandfather of McCain's child. He claimed McCain was never around and even said the day baby was born, he denied being the father. I recall that his, he didn't say the baby was too light skinned. The baby is. Hill went on to say there were numerous altercations with McCain that led up to a protective order against him. I went up, up to the McDonald's in the parking lot where well, he had my grandson in his hand. I wouldn't let him, let him go because my daughter it was still freaking going on. My daughter was ready to leave and he didn't want to let, let my grandson go. After Hill took the stand, his daughter testified. Sahara Palette Hill says during their relationship, McCain was physically and verbally abusive toward her. She told the courtroom about an incident where McCain grabbed the steering wheel as she was driving with their one-year-old son in the back seat. While we were on the road and we were having like this argument, he suddenly grabbed a hold of the steering wheel and he was immediately trying to get us off the road, trying to crash, try to crash us into a ditch or so. He was so angry and frustrating that he he threatened to to kill kill me. Now this is still all part of the punishment phase. When the jury does deliberate, they can sentence McCain to life in prison without parole or the death penalty. Court resumes tomorrow at 1:30. Erica Hernandez, case at 12 News. Other top stories we're following today. San Antonio police say a woman recovering after she was shot this morning. It happened just after 3 a.m. at the Oak Manor Apartments off Austin Highway on the city's northeast side. Officers say a man in his 20s playing with a gun when it went off, hitting a woman in the leg. The man dropped the gun, took off, was later arrested. He's expected to face charges. That woman was treated on scene. A couple thankful to be unharmed after a bullet shattered a window of their home this morning, narrowly missing them. Police said the bullet flew into their house near St. Phillips College on the east side around 6 a.m. The bullet actually ended up lodged in a television. A woman and her husband in bed at that time, they say when they heard the shots, they grabbed each other and hit the floor. Police think the bullet came from a long distance away, but that location has not been pinpointed. San Antonio police searching for a driver. They say hit three construction workers while driving along I-35 near the Alamo Street exit. This happened around 1 a.m. Officers on the scene tell us a silver Chevy HHR plowed through a construction area, hitting three TxDOT crew members who were working on a road closure there. The driver then took off without stopping to help. Police say two of the workers, both men ages 21 and 23, were taken to a hospital with serious injuries. The third worker, a 22 year old woman, suffered a broken leg. It's unclear what led the driver to crash into them. It turning back to COVID now with 70% of all Americans 18 and older getting at least one COVID vaccination. There's now talk of a third booster being needed. 
Last month, Pfizer asked the FDA for approval to administer a third shot to boost immunity. But Ursula Perry reports in the meantime, scientists are now trying to determine if a third booster shot could even work. Researchers at 12 sites across the country studying the safety and the body's immune response to a mixed booster shot of one of the three vaccines approved under FDA emergency use authorization. Scientists want to know if you got a Moderna or a Pfizer shot, would it be better to stay with one of those two or get a J&J &J shot? So we are studying all of the different combinations in order to answer that question. It can be confusing. Should people who initially got one J&J &J shot get a second one, or should they get a Pfizer or Moderna shot? Right now, researchers are enrolling fully vaccinated adults to get that third shot. Volunteers will provide blood samples so that researchers can study their immune responses. Researchers say it's important information to have as more COVID-19 variants like Delta are identified. So just like with the flu vaccine, you get a dose each year because the variants or the types of influenza change. The concern is that at some point our current vaccinations might not protect us as well as they are doing right now for the variants. Researchers will be following these participants for a full year, but we may have initial results by the fall. This particular study that looks at different kinds of booster shots and what combination might work is already underway, but not here in San Antonio. If you'd like to take a look at a similar study that you could enroll in, go to clinicaltrials.com and just put in San Antonio, Texas. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Coming up in our KSAT Q&A, we're continuing the COVID conversation with a local emergency room doctor who will tell us what he is seeing on the front lines right here in our ERs at home. And coming up right after the break, efforts to get rid of some slimy visitors that are threatening native plants and species in the San Antonio River. A destructive and invasive species has been spotted along the San Antonio River. Apple snails are back, which pose a threat to aquatic plants and native species of the river. Crews and volunteers with the San Antonio River Authority working to remove those apple snails as well as any egg cases. Alicia Barrera spoke to the Environmental Science Division of SARA about what to look for and what to do if you spot any apple snails. Good afternoon. Well, these apple snails, what they do is take away food and habitat to the native species in the San Antonio River. And the problem is that they work quickly. The focus now is to remove the egg cases as one single egg case can hold thousands of these snails. So what do you need to look out for? The dark colored apple snails are the size of a fist. They can be spotted along the banks of the river. And if you look closely, you may also see a bubblegum pink material. Those are the egg cases. So the big question, how do they even get here? Experts believe someone may have dumped their aquarium into the river back in 2019, and the ones we're seeing now stem from that uneducated action. According to the San Antonio River Authority, the non-native species was first spotted in October of 2019 along the museum reach section of the river. It's the same case this year round, except they're multiplying even faster. It was about 3,600 egg cases last year. We're already up to over 7,600 egg cases this year with the adults three or four times more than they were in 2020. So it's, it's pretty bad and it's just consistently getting worse from over the last couple of years. If they start going downstream away from the channelized areas of the river walk and into the natural parts of the river, they can eat the vegetation on the banks and they can cut back that vegetation so much that we can start having erosion along the banks. Along the river, you'll see signage with pictures of what to look out for during your next trip to the river. Be on the lookout, but don't pick them up. You can report them directly at 866-345-7272 or online with as much detail as possible. But more than anything, the San Antonio River Authority says that they need volunteers in order to help monitor, collect, and dispose of these apple snails. On KSAT.com, we have all the information listed in order to become a volunteer. Reporting Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. All right, I think we all got kind of the heebie-jeebies with that video. It was the, the exacts. Rain? Was it the rain? No, the rain is beautiful. <laughs> it was the I know, I know, I know it was the, yeah. That was a problem.
But let's focus on the rain. Yes, let's look yes. at something more, a little more let's positive. Talk about that. that was lovely. And some maintenance rain. I know we had some flash flooding issues here and there, but uh, overall it was good maintenance rain and good soaking rain to maintain our lack of drought around south and central Texas. Now going forward, we still have some rain chances. We just think today was the main event. We'll have some isolated to widely separated activity popping up here and there the next several days all the way through Friday and then this weekend it looks like we'll clear on out and dry out. So let's talk about how much rain fell and where and of course highly variable. You look at Von Army and about three inches in that big rain gauge and along with a friendly little grasshopper there. You look elsewhere and you can see southeast of San Antonio, not even a drop, but you get to Fair Oaks Ranch, five and a half inches, Spring Branch, about five inches. And actually we had a viewer send us a reading of seven inches within Spring Branch. So overall, some healthy rainfall accumulations, especially right along the aquifer recharge zone, this purple area here. That's where the sweet spot is for us to really boost the aquifer most efficiently. It's nice to get it in the red area, the contributing zone as well, but you can see here, Good soaking rainfall along the contributing and the recharge zone. So this is nice to see. I know the aquifer technically was down a little bit today, but it takes a little while. There's a lag time between the rain and then the aquifer rising and responding. So we do anticipate it to respond very soon and even tomorrow we should see an improvement. Right now you look at the rain, most of it's closer to Austin. That's where the vast majority of the showers are. Of course, thunderstorms are non severe in nature, just loud and some heavy rain associated with them moving through Limber Wimberley and just clipping the northern shore of Canyon Lake. Elsewhere, this light green, that's just some typical stratiform light rain that's falling. One even lightning bolt there north of Sisterdale in northern Kendall County. So that's just good soaking rain. Wimberley, this is the heavy stuff and that's where you got to be on the alert for the potential of some uh, flash flooding that's approach that could approach the I-35 corridor. And we talked about this downpour moving toward Dehennis. It's falling apart. These are having a pretty short lifespan this afternoon as they push southward out of the hill country. They're running into more stable air here and along Highway 90 and south of San Antonio. No action right now, but I like to point that out because I think that's where our sweet spot will be later on tonight in terms of any development. Here's the big picture over the past 12 hours. A lot of activity popping up across the state. Again, good maintenance rain. The main driving force for this was this front that was dropping southward as a weak cool front and now it's stalled. So it's just a stationary boundary there, but these act as the focal point to help lift the air and generate those showers and thunderstorms. Basically, they just take advantage of the instability and help kickstart those showers and storms. Here's our future cast and it overdoes things a little bit this evening. Nonetheless, it does show that slight chance of a few showers making their way closer to San Antonio this evening. A slight chance of that. And then tonight, closer to the boundary, which is south of us, that's where we're anticipating some development for some of our southern counties. Dimmit, LaSalle, McMullen, even B County, Atascosa, can't rule that out. Frio County can't rule it out tonight into tomorrow morning. It's a slight chance, but it's there. 85 now, dew point is 74. Feels like 92 because it's humid. Converse at 86, Divine 85, and look at those 70s. Comfort and Kerrville, both 73, where we've had the recent rain and the low clouds and that light, gentle soaking rain. We're down in the 70s. Meanwhile, Kennedy at 92. That should be our high temperature tomorrow. Lower 90s. We'll have a mixture of sun and clouds. A few isolated to widely separated pop up showers and storms possible here and there during the day. Same goes for every day through Friday keeping temperatures in the low 90s till this weekend as we return back to sunshine mid 90s. OK, thank you, Adam. All right, free agency is here and there are a lot of people who are expecting the Spurs to be free agency players, Greg. Yeah, in this particular case with DeMar DeRozan, could they work out a sign and trade deal with another team? He is one of the top four free agents this offseason. When we come back, we'll list the teams that are so-called interested in DeMar and becoming a part of their team. And is this a breakout season for Randy Gregory? All indications are yes. He was headed to the Lakers, and now the Knicks are showing interest in Spurs free agent DeMar DeRozan, such as the start of free agency in the NBA. The Spurs have three significant free agents in DeMar, Rudy Gay and Patty Mills. Mills is still playing in the Olympics, of course, for his home country. According to Hoops analyst Net, the Lakers are out of the DeMar DeRozan sweepstakes, with the Knicks now interested in a deal. The Miami Heat may also be trying to reunite DeMar with Kyle Lowry, his old Raptor teammate. And there are reports that the Celtics and the Jazz are interested in Rudy. Stay tuned for more. 
Camping with KSAT, powered by Davis Law Firm. Randy Gregory only played 10 games last season. That defensive end is now looking for his first full season in the NFL since his reinstatement. The way things are going in training camp, it appears he's headed for a breakout season. I definitely feel more confident. That's obviously going to go up. Some more, we get some games, uh, you know, under my belt. Oh, what a difference a year makes, or in the case of Randy Gregory, seven. So I'm going into my seventh year, but, you know, it's really like my fourth. And um, so, you know, I still feel young. Um, still can do all the things I could do before and more. Um, but I just got to take care of myself a little bit more. Gregory missed the entire 2017 and 2019 seasons and only played in two games during the 2016 season before he was reinstated in 2020, missing the first six games as part of his return process from substance abuse and mental health issues. I still have a lot to prove. Let's not, you know, I think there's a lot of talk going around right now. I, I really believe I'm having a good offseason, um, but there's still a lot to prove on the field. From this point on, I just got to, like I said, put some some good play on the field and um, stay out of trouble, which I'm trying to do, and um, be the guy that everyone expects me to be and I expect myself to be. I would never run a reverse back to Randy Gregory when I look back in the old days. I mean, and uh, we ran two his way, and we, you know, can't get outside of him. He, he, he's a great athlete, uh, definitely in space, but, you know, he has a really good understanding. He has a knack for that. He's, you know, that's, that's something that, you know, uh, he, he's done for very well his whole, whole, his whole time in the league, and I think it was evident twice here in yesterday's practice. Randy's recovery has been nothing short of remarkable, and his play on the field is a great example. Underutilized last season by then-defensive coordinator Mike Nolan, Gregory will get more chances this season under Dan Quinn. You have to be comfortable with yourself, um, confident in yourself, and, uh, you know, in, in times in the past, I was a very anxious individual, a very... Um, uh, I was a guy that had, you know, low self uh, self esteem, and um, I didn't do very well in situations like this or situations where I had to bring out my leadership skills and, um, you know, really be confident in myself. And um, like I said, you know, being confident on the field and off the field, they kind of go hand in hand. And um, when I'm doing well on one end, I think I'll do well on the other. In just 10 games last season, Randy had three and a half sacks, 21 combined tackles, 15 solo, with four tackles for a loss and 12 quarterback hits. Everybody wants to play. I wanted to play, obviously. Um, you know, I had my chances, and uh, I think I, I did a good job during those chances. And, you know, big thing this year is just getting more of those chances and being able to go out there and produce. And, you know, the Cowboys are so impressed, they've actually put them on their 14-player leadership council that consults with the, the players and also the staff and the head coach. Well, if they get to Nebraska, Randy Gregory, I mean, that, that they thought they were getting right, the draft. Right, right. It, huge potential. It, it'll be great to see this season if yeah. that's the case. Thanks, Greg. Mm -hmm. Our KSAT Q&A is next. Our hospitals and our local health care staff feeling the strain as the number of hospitalized COVID-19 patients continue to rise day by day in this latest surge. In today's KSAT Q&A, we're joined by Dr. Robert A. Frolickstein, emergency room physician at Methodist Hospital. Doctor, thanks for sharing some time with us uh, here today. Let's just talk yeah. about where we are now. We talked to you in the last surge uh, during the fall and the winter. So describe what you're seeing in the ER right now. So thanks for having, having me on and giving me this opportunity. You know, I think that numbers are probably not as high as they were at the peak of the last surge, but we're also not at the peak of this surge. So who knows where it's going to go, but it does. I mean, they're definitely, COVID is back. We're seeing lots of patients uh, with COVID. Um, probably a little bit younger uh, population is getting COVID. Um, I would say it's about the same as far as who needs to be admitted versus who can go home, uh, but people are sick. And, you know, there's a lot of people coming in and they've never been this sick in their life. But, you know, thankfully their oxygen, oxygenation is, is good and they don't have to be admitted to the hospital, but they feel terrible. How, what's the, can you put a percentage on it on the number of patients you've seen that have had to be hospitalized when it comes to whether they were vaccinated or not? Uh, I don't, um, I personally have only admitted one patient um, that is vaccinated for COVID-19. Um, I would say, talking to all my colleagues and my, my colleagues in the intensive care unit, 
more than 95 percent are unvaccinated. Can you talk a little bit about the symptoms that people are experiencing? I mean, saying that, you know, they've never felt this sick in their life. Are things any different with the Delta variant compared to what we saw in the fall and winter? Not really as far as the type of symptoms. I think it's just the severity. And, and you know, it's a virus and the same, all viruses cause this, we call it malaise, where you just feel lousy and you have body aches and, of course, fever a lot of nasal congestion, cough, shortness of breath. And those those symptoms are the same as the prior surges. Um, it just seems to be a little more severe. Talk to me about the personal face of this for you and other healthcare workers in town. I mean, you and I joked with each other that we enjoy talking to each other, but we hope we never have to talk to each other again. Yeah. And this whole thing, you know, maybe over a beer, but not certainly over Zoom talking about the next surge. Right. What does this mean for you and your colleagues? I mean, it, they're talking about nursing staff that's burnt out that just isn't coming back. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of people that are, are stressed and fatigued. I mean, what does this mean for you and your colleagues? Um, yeah, you know, this, this one seems harder. And I think there's a couple reasons. One is that, you know, the prior surges, a lot of the people that needed to come to the hospital for other things like appendicitis didn't come. And, and I'm glad they're still coming, and they are still coming. And so that does make it harder on us, though. But I think the, by far the biggest thing that makes this hard is it seems like it all should be preventable. This shouldn't have happened. And and if, you know, a bigger percentage of the population was vaccinated, this would not have happened. Preventable if vaccinated. So. You right. said that we're not at the peak of this surge. So going forward, as we see these numbers continue to rise, which is certainly expected, how do you think that Methodist Hospital, our local health care system, is going to fare when we're talking about a much different scenario than when people, as you mentioned, weren't coming to the hospital for other routine things? Yeah, so we're, you know, one good thing about this is we've gone through this a few times before and we're, we're pretty good at um, making space, making places for people to be seen and, and treated. Um, so I think we're going to do okay as far as capacity. Um, it's if we can keep our staff healthy and if we can keep them burned out, then I think we'll do okay as, as far as that goes. You know, I, I, we have not yet cut back on any elective cases or elective procedures or anything like that. And and, you know, I think the hope is that we don't have to do that. Um, but certainly that's one of the strategies when you start running out of beds. That's certainly one of the strategies that you have to consider. I hope we don't ever get there. You know, you and I have done, and Myra have done this interview numerous times, and I always like to give you the last word, the last message to our viewers out there. You have a platform here, doctor. What would you say to the viewers who are out there? You know, COVID's back. By far and away, the most um, effective tool you have to prevent getting it or giving it to others is to get vaccinated. All the other stuff like social distancing and masking helps also, but by far and away, our, our strongest tool is, is vaccination. So, and it's not too late. Go get it right now. There's places all over the city. It's free. It's easy. Go get vaccinated. I've not seen a single complication of vaccine in my 18 months of doing or however long the vaccine's been around nine months i'm not seeing one case of someone coming in because of the vaccine caused the problem and the vaccine a critical tool in keeping you keeping patients from seeing you keeping you out of the hospital right and it, it doesn't mean you won't get it you know just like the flu people that get the flu vaccine sometimes will get the flu but typically the ones that we've seen that have had the vaccine it's much less severe and it's, it's just going to dramatically decrease your chances of getting COVID or spreading COVID. Dr. Robert Frolickstein, I can't promise that we're not going to have this discussion again in the coming weeks, but I always appreciate your time. All right. Thanks, Myra. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. We'll be right back. To the Olympics now and word today that we will see Simone Biles back in action. When she'll next compete plus the heartwarming moment between two athletes that showed us what the games are all about. Here's ABC's Jim Ryan.
Simone Biles will be back on the floor in the balance beam finals tomorrow after openly admitting her struggles with the twisties and withdrawing from multiple events. Teammate Jade Carey won gold this morning in the floor event and reacted to Biles' return. Having Simone being back tomorrow is great. I'm really proud of her. She's been through a lot this Olympics, so it's going to be great to see her out there tomorrow. Carey was coached by her father, who was on hand for her big moment. It means everything to me to have my dad here. We've been working so hard for this together, so I'm really glad that I was able to do that for us tonight. It's Jade's first Olympic medal. She was not a part of the team that won silver in the team event. Heartbreak for the women's soccer team. Team USA fell one to nothing to Canada, but will play for the bronze on Thursday. And on the diamond, Team USA fell to Japan in extra innings in the quarterfinals. The Americans will still play in the semis. The USA women's basketball team continued its winning ways, defeating France 93-82 for its 52nd consecutive win in Olympics competition. The team advances to the quarterfinals. And through sportsmanship, John Marco Tamberi of Italy and Mutas Essa Barshim of Qatar jumped into each other's arms after agreeing to share the gold in the high jump instead of going to a jump off. Tamberi was unable to compete in Rio because of injuries. The two friends are ecstatic with the outcome. Jim Ryan, ABC News, Tokyo. Love that moment. I didn't know you could do that. I didn't either. I thought maybe they had to like cut it in half. <laughs> Or like you get quite, it on this month, literally. you get it on this month, <laughs> or whatever. Split joint custody yeah. of yeah. the But I'm glad they panel. both got it. Yeah. Just, just check. That is, yeah. that is nice. It is nice. By the way, this is not August-like weather. Just Ooh. like we were saying, it's not July-like weather. Not so long ago. <laughs> July ended 2.5 <laughs> degrees below average here yeah. in San Antonio. Okay. We had two days where the temperature was at average and no days where it was above average. Uh, it's, as we start August, it's still going to be unseasonably cool. We're going to talk about the temperature trend, rainfall chances, and what we still have out there on the radar coming right up. All right, check this out. Florida A&M University giving students a big financial boost during commencement yesterday. 2020 graduates were told by University President Larry Robinson the school was paying off outstanding student balances for the entire year. Oh, the university used more than $16 million of federal CARES Act funding to cover fees and tuition. Other historically black colleges and universities have made similar announcements with Clark Atlanta University planning to clear student account balances for spring 2020 through summer of 2021. Nice surprise there. Mm. In the buzz today, comedian Kathy Griffin facing a serious health battle. Today, Griffin announced that she has stage one lung cancer and she says she's never smoked. Griffin says she will undergo surgery to have half of her left lung removed. She does not expect to have to undergo chemotherapy or radiation and says she should be, quote, up and running around as usual in a month or less, end quote. In July 2017, Griffin shaved her head in honor of her sister Joyce, who was also battling cancer. Her sister died that September. Griffin also lost her brother, Gary, to cancer in 2014. Zoom has agreed to pay $85 million in a settlement in a lawsuit over data privacy and Zoom bombing. The video conferencing service, which of course became essential during the pandemic, was plagued by hackers. Customers complained their private meetings were being interrupted by people shouting profanity or even sharing pornography. In response to the lawsuit, Zoom Video Communications says it's improving security, improving safeguards for consumer data, under the settlement, some paid subscribers will be eligible for 15% refunds on their Zoom subscriptions or $25, whichever is larger. Well, today is National Coloring Book Day. Oh, we went back to Kathy Griffin. National, oh, that gets an applause over there. Okay, coloring wow. books. They've long been a child favorite, <laughs> though you're never too old to take to a box of crayons. Many coloring books have been geared toward adults as well, and their popularity boomed during the pandemic as they're said to reduce stress. Hmm. Nowadays, you have tons of options from a slew of coloring books that are sold everywhere. You can even download designs, print them yourself, and give yourself permission to Every once in a while, just go outside the lines. Go crazy. How creative. <laughs> I'll tell you what, <laughs> with the rain this morning, there was no playground available. So we busted out some coloring books 
See, there and you that, go. It came in handy. I'm convinced, though, National Coloring Book Day was sponsored by Crayola. <laughs> Shocking. No, no, I don't, I'm not saying it's true. I'm just, that's what I'm thinking. I'm just saying I believe you. You're yeah. probably right. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was one of those Monday mornings. It was kind of hard to get up and get moving with all the rain. You just wanted to roll over in bed and uh, hit the snooze button if you could. And it was good maintenance rain that we had out there. Some soaking rain, and it did cause some flash flooding issues. But overall, this is good for the aquifer, and it's good for maintaining our lack of drought. More rain chances in the days ahead, but we really think today was our main event. And it's going to remain unseasonably cool for the rest of this week. Take a look at this. Here we go. Westover Hills, not far from SeaWorld. Look at that, an inch and a quarter in the rain gauge there. Good shot of that rain gauge, and some rain gauges had over five inches of rain, and particularly up in Spring Branch. One of our viewers recorded seven inches, and rain is localized. We know it's hit or miss. Right now it's hitting basically I-35 from Buda to Kyle to San Marcos, and then northern Guadalupe County, just south of Martindale, within our viewing area here, south of Lockhart. We've got downpour, a little bit of lightning and thunder. This is just outside of New Braunfels. New Braunfels, though, you just had the cool gust front move through, or outflow boundary, I should say. And this outflow boundary is right along I-35 and it's moving through San Antonio all the way already through most of the north side of town. It's headed toward downtown. There is the chance that this outflow boundary could kick up one or two more showers and thunderstorms as it travels through San Antonio. That's why we're keeping that slight chance of rain in the forecast through the rest of this evening. But we're largely in a more stable atmosphere here around Bear County and San Antonio up in the hill country. What's left over of the thunderstorms earlier this afternoon is mostly just this light rain indicated indicated by that green color on the radar screen. Not much farther west of town right now. Northern Valverde County had several inches of rain, uh, two and a half inches in some parts. But now we're starting to see the activation closer to the frontal boundary. We're talking about this, how tonight we are expecting some development farther south. I mean, we're talking Dimmit, LaSalle and McMullen counties. Choke Canyon there, and that's closer to the cool front that dropped in and is now south of San Antonio. And that's going to be basically the focal point of the thunderstorms for tonight and even into tomorrow morning. Some of those could drift northward and make it to San Antonio. We could have a little bit of development, but right now we're anticipating most of it closer to the boundary, the forcing mechanism, and even farther south. That should say 20 percent, not 24 percent on Friday. We do not have that kind of resolution, meteorologically speaking, 23 or 25 percent. What should we get it? There's no difference. OK, uh, that's just say 20 percent. Either way, 30, 30 percent the rest of this week and even on into Friday, some widely separated or isolated showers popping up here and there, especially in the afternoon hours. Today at the airport, 0.37 inches, 87 the high temperature. That's 10 degrees below average right now. We're at 85. Dew point is 74, so it feels like 92. A lot of soil moisture out there, and that's going to limit our warming even this weekend when we break out into full sunshine. 73 Comfort, 78 Canyon Lake, Castroville now at 87, one of the warmer spots, Catula 89. But look at Laredo nearby, 77. You got some rain cooled air, outflow boundaries down in Webb County. Of course, we have the high humidity with the recent rain despite the northeasterly breeze. Spotty showers through 8, 9 o'clock locally, but farther south of town, you have higher rain chances. LaSalle, McMullen, even Dimmick counties. 74 tomorrow morning, otherwise 92 by the afternoon. A few more showers and thunderstorms could be popping up, isolated in nature the next several days through Friday, then sunny and clear into the weekend. Mid 90s, though, which is average. The average high is 97. Okay, thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Morning. It is Monday, August 2nd. One woman recovering after a shooting on the city's northeast side. Some police on the scene telling us a man in his 20s was playing with a gun. That's when it went off and actually shot a woman in the leg. Now the suspect dropped the gun and ran off, but he was later found and arrested. He is now expected to face charges. As for the victim, that woman suffered minor injuries. She was treated on the scene. As the Delta variant drives a new wave of COVID cases in San Antonio, hospitals have already been dealing with more people overall. Volume is, you know, 30 to 50 percent year on year. 
compared to 20, but also to 2019 as well. And Eric Epley, the head of the Southwest Texas Regional Advisory Council, or STRAC, says things are getting tight. If an emergency room is getting strained, they can request EMS divert patients elsewhere for a few hours to give them a chance to get through the current patient load. We also now know the name of a man killed in a crash over the weekend. He's been identified as 51-year-old Anthony James Flowers. He died Saturday evening in a rollover crash on Booker T Road in F Street on the east side. Investigators say Flowers was speeding, lost control, hit a utility pole. A front seat passenger was taken to the hospital. No update on his condition. Working to learn the name of a man who died while trying to cross Castorville Road. It happened about 4.30 this morning. The San Antonio police say the victim was not using a crosswalk and did not yield to traffic. He was the first hit by one vehicle. That driver pulled over and called 911. The victim was then hit by another driver and died at the scene. Right, that outflow boundary I was talking about moving through San Antonio and Bear County is really generating one downpour near Live Oak, uh, not far from the mall there uh, to 1604 and 35. It shouldn't last all that long, but it's one little downpour that has been generated by that uh, outflow boundary that's moving through. Otherwise, we're fairly stable and not seeing much pop. A few daily light rain chances or isolated rain chances the rest of the week. Temperatures not all that bad. Thanks, Adam. And thanks for watching the news at 6. See you on the night beat at 10.